I've heard many times we have businesses that have openings, but they just can't find good quality employees. And that's where we want to know today. Where are the gaps? What can we do to close those gaps? So at this time, I'm going to open the meeting or, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Doyle and Mr. Hudson. The Board of Commissioners are going to sit back and absorb the information that is presented to us today. So at this time, I call this meeting to order. As you'll see in your order of presentations, we have three sections today. We will first receive a statewide perspective on the economy. That will be followed by some information about regional employment and industry trends, as well as some information specifically about military transition to work in our state and in our local area. Finally, we'll end up our summit with local workforce training and certification programs. As you know, this is the second summit that the Board of Commissioners has offered, and we hope that these information sessions provide information not just to our citizens, but our business and industry in Onslow County. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Jeff Hudson, our County Manager. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to thank Dr. Doyle and her staff uh, for taking the lead and putting on this our second summit. It's really important that we get great information out to the public and to all the decision makers in our community. So thank you, Dr. Doyle, for you and your staff. Our first speaker is Dr. Adam T. Jones. And uh, you'll see complete bios in your packet at your desk or at your, your seat. Uh, I would like to say that Dr. Jones uh, is a regional economist in the Swain Center for Business and Professional Services an assistant professor at, in UNCW's Cameron School of Business. Dr. Jones joined the faculty of UNCW in 2010, where he's an active teacher and researcher, teaching over 2,000 students and publishing works in, in various professional publications. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him with us today to give us uh, an overview. So at this time, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Adam Jones. Dr. Jones, thank you. Well, good morning. Thank, thank y'all for having me this morning. So in, in my regular everyday life, I teach students at UNCW and they are not nearly as wide-eyed and awake as you all are at this hour of the morning. <laughs> all right, so I'm excited to be here. Um, I don't know if any of you know what today is, but today would be Dr. Seuss's birthday. So I thought maybe as we think a little bit about where the economy is and where it's going, we'll see if we can put a little bit of a Dr. Seuss theme to it. So we'll see how this goes. All right, so I figured I would title this morning's talk, Oh, the Places North Carolina Will Go. So what we're going to do is we are going to try and cover about two hours worth of material in 20 minutes. So we're going to have to be kind of clipping through this. We're going to think a little bit about where the state has been, uh, where it is now and where it's going. So when we think about where it's going, share a little bit of a perspective from our point of view at the university about what we're looking to try and impart the students and what we think the future of the labor force might look like. All right, so let's get going. So where have we been and where are we going? So today is our day. We're off to great places, hopefully, hopefully. So there's a lot to be concerned about, but I think overall, we're headed in the right direction. So if we start out with thinking about state output or national output, uh, both of which are in this chart. So the blue lines are the nation, the red lines are growth of North Carolina's uh, regional output. You can see there's a definite split between the left-hand side of the chart and the right-hand side of the chart. So coming out of the recession, growth has been slow. That's the reason that we feel as though we're still in a recession, that we never really got going again. Um, so the, the good news is we're growing. The bad news is it's maybe not as quickly as we want, uh, but that's also sort of to be expected coming out of financial recessions. So financial recessions are typically longer and slower recoveries as uh, households and firms repair their balance sheets. It just takes time. So be patient. If we look uh, a little bit more zoomed in at the recovery, we can see that North Carolina has lagged slightly behind the nation in terms of its recovery. We're just a little bit slower 
getting going and coming out of it, but I think that means that we'll outperform the nation over the next couple of years. So if you look at North Carolina, we have a tendency to lag slightly behind, uh, but we'll catch up and I think outperform. So looking forward, what does the national outlook uh, look like? So the Federal Reserve, who has one of the largest and most professional forecasting staffs, thinks that the nation is going to see moderate growth over the next couple of years and a slow reduction in the remaining slack in the labor force. So if we look at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate looks pretty good right now, but that masks some of the remaining problems, uh, such as labor force participation rates and part-time employment uh, for folks who would prefer to have full-time employment. But that will probably continue to diminish over the next couple of years. So the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, is forecasting the nation's economy to grow at just under 2.5% per year. Uh, they tend to be an optimistic group over the last couple of years and have overestimated growth slightly. But nevertheless, I think the outlook going forward is positive. There are some risks. We'll talk about those in a minute. But why is this so important to think about the nation and what the Fed is doing? Well, the Fed is in charge of monetary policy and importantly, uh, setting the benchmark interest rates. So they have started to lift the federal funds rate. And there's a lot of discussion about why start now when we're not yet back at full employment. Well, the federal funds rate is close to zero right now. It's gonna take several years to get it back to its benchmark rate. And if they start too late, then they're gonna to have to raise interest rates beyond the target to slow growth and keep us on the path we need to be. So the Fed has to act based on their expectations of the future. You're talking about a three, four year process probably to get this back to where it needs to be. So they need to start moving now, even if we're not yet back to what we might consider full employment and potential output. So we'll see that a little bit more in just a second. All right, so what about the state? So I think the state also has a positive but only moderate growth profile going forward. We'll grow similar to the nation, likely a little bit faster. So if you look at several different models of state growth, uh, the average tends to be about 2.5% or so. So just a little bit above where most of us think the nation is going to be going forward. All right, so let's think about why this national outlook and the Fed are so important. So a quick primer or refresher on what is the Federal Reserve? What do they do? So the Federal Reserve's Federal Open Market Committee, it's a committee of 19 members, uh, 12 of whom are voting members, try and fulfill a dual mandate. So their dual mandate is to set monetary policy such as that prices are stable, which they define as 2% inflation, and to maximize employment, try and minimize unemployment. So that means when times are bad, they uh, pursue monetary stimulus, lower the interest rates, essentially injecting money into the economy to try and stimulate growth. And more recently, they've added almost sort of a third unofficial mandate, and that's an increased emphasis on financial stability. So in the financial crisis, the Fed was made, I guess, more aware that financial stability has a direct effect on the real economy, on Main Street. Wall Street and Main Street are linked, whether we want them to be or not. So the Fed has started to put more emphasis on paying attention to what's going on in the financial markets, as well as just looking at unemployment and inflation. All right, so what is the Fed going to do in the future and why? So if we look at a chart of output versus potential output, the blue line is what's referred to as potential output. So this is what the US economy could produce when we're firing on all cylinders. When we're at maximum employment, uh, people are working, we can see what we could produce. The red line is what we actually produce. So that big dip in separation is a fairly obvious recession, right? And a deep one that we're still digging our way out of. But the gap between these two lines has narrowed uh, considerably over the last couple of years. This is the recovery. As we approach full employment or potential output again, when those two lines hit is when the Fed wants to have interest rates back at their more normal level, uh, as they like to say, having removed the accommodation. Um, so they're targeting that point, which is still a couple of years in our future, but they've got to start moving now. All right, so what does the separation between the two lines mean? Well, it means 
the, when the red line is below the blue line, we're producing at less than our potential, and that means we're not using all of our labor force. So this is reflected by looking at unemployment rates. You can see the huge increase when we went into the recession, when we output dropped off. Uh, so looking at the lines, it may be kind of hard to see from where you are. They tend to move together. Um, the Jacksonville area, which is the red one, uh, performed a little bit better in the recession. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily comforting. It's kind of like when you have your wisdom teeth pulled and someone said, hey, it went really smoothly. And you say, well, my face is still really sore, right? So it didn't necessarily, I mean, you did a little bit better, but it's still a painful process for everybody. So why the difference for Jacksonville versus the state and the nation? Um, pr probably that a lot of your employment is driven by, uh, let's say, political factors, thinking about military employment as opposed to some of the economic factors that drive employment in the rest of the state or the nation. All right, so that's part of the Fed's dual mandate is trying to maximize employment. We can see we're nearing full employment again. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer back to what you might consider normal. And what about on the inflation side? So inflation has been low over the last couple years, uh, but is expected to pick up in the near future. So what's keeping inflation down? A large part of it is the drop in energy prices. Um, so as oil settles into more of a normal price, um, these transitory effects that are holding down inflation will wane with time. So what does that mean for the Fed? That means it's time for them to start thinking about the path for interest rates, trying to raise the interest rate back towards its normal. So this is the infamous dot plot from the Fed of, okay, where do these 19 members of the committee think the, the federal funds rate will be, and why do, wait, what is the federal funds rate and why do we care about it? So the federal funds rate is the rate at which banks lend to each other. Why do you and I care about that rate? Because what we pay is highly correlated with it. So if a bank has a choice, do they loan the Jones or do they loan to another bank? They say, well, we're willing to loan the Jones as long as he pays us a premium for his credit risk. So my interest rate is tied to what they could lend the other banks at plus that credit risk. So as the federal funds rate increases, so will mortgage rates for me and for the rest of us. All right, so the Fed thinks that this rate will increase over the next couple of years. Um, markets think they're maybe a little optimistic about it. But the consensus seems to be that we'll be back to normal interest rates sometime around late 2018 or so, so maybe in the early 2019. So we've got a couple years to go of this transition. Now, having said that, I've been talking about growth going forward, and you're like, wait, that doesn't necessarily match with what my gut tells me. Right? There's a lot of angst and anxiety out there. Uh, and I understand why. That's driven largely by the slow recovery and by some of the risks that we'll talk about ju in just a second. But the data doesn't yet say it's time to panic. So if we look at uh, a graph of recession probabilities, we can see spikes that clearly match the recessions, the shaded areas in the diagram. And on the far right-hand side where we are now, there's a little bit of an uptick, but not yet a big spike. So is, are there risks? Yes. Is it time to panic? No, I don't think so. All right, so let's turn and look at North Carolina itself. So North Carolina's leading indicators are also telling a story of growth. Matter of fact, the most recent observations say that next year could be a really good year. Now, it's entirely possible that that's a little blip, but it still suggests growth going forward. All right, so what makes us optimistic about this? Well, if we look at North Carolina employment by sector, there are a couple sectors worth looking at that are often bellwethers. So there are two different lines in here. One is a five-year average of growth in each sector. That's the red one. And the blue line is the year-over-year -year, uh, growth ending in June of 2015. So that's the most recent data that's available. It's lagged, especially when you start getting down to the smaller regions. Um, but a couple worth looking at, our construction is once again picking up and starting to tick along. Uh, anecdotally, I notice this when I'm out riding my bicycle on a weekend, I'm starting to hear circular saws and nail guns again. I think that's a very positive sign. Uh, maybe most importantly is if we look at professional and business services, it's picking up the pace. 
All right, so why is that important? So professional and business services is employment in uh, firms and in industries that sell primarily to other businesses. This suggests that businesses are turning the corner and starting to become confident again. So as business confidence increases, so will their hiring, so will employment, so will wages. This is a critical factor for us to keep an eye on and it's showing positive signs that we're coming over the hurdle. So I think there's a lot to be uh, excited about. There's also uh, some risks to consider. All right, so back to our Dr. Seuss story. So whenever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest, except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. So we think it's going to be good, but there are some risks to consider. So what are those risks, and how large are they? So the first of which we should talk about is probably commodity prices, and especially crude oil prices. So the price of crude oil has fallen considerably. Now, when crude oil prices fall, there are two potential reasons for this. The last time crude oil prices fell off the cliff, the big drop in the middle was the recession. We go, oh no, crude oil prices fall, that's bad, that means demand is sinking. Well, that's one reason prices could fall. The other is that supply expands, causing prices to fall. So the most recent decline in crude oil prices is believed to be more supply-driven than demand-driven. So we are awash in crude at the moment, uh, which is good and bad. So that's why I'm not quite sure exactly how this is going to play out and the effects will play out at different rates. So as the price of crude falls, that means gasoline prices fall, which all of us are excited about. Every time I fill up my tank, I go, whew, thank goodness it's not $50 anymore, right? It feels good to get out a little bit cheaper. Now, the downside of that from an economic growth perspective is that many firms invested in exploration and equipment when the prices were higher, expecting prices to remain high, and they have since cut back their investment. So there's a, a sort of a reshuffling going on in many industries as we work through this oversupply. So is it, oh, well, that's the BP and the big oil companies are getting hit. Okay, well, that's true. We don't necessarily all feel real sorry for them, but the bigger concern is that their purchases of drilling pipe and uh, hiring of truck drivers and all of those other inputs they buy is also declining, so it's hurting small businesses as well. So it'll take some time for us to sort through this. So we've got a positive uh, stimulus in the reduction in energy prices, uh, but we also have a negative one in the reduction of business investment. So maybe they offset each other a little bit. The one that's more concerning when we're thinking about risks is the external sector. And that's that our trading partners are slowing down. China, it, depending on which statistics you look at and how much you believe their statistics, is slowing down. China says not much. I think that the story might be a little worse than the official statistics actually make it look. But nevertheless, if you look at our main trading partners, North Carolina's main trading partners, Canada, Mexico, China, and Japan, they're all slowing down or at best treading water. So that's going to dampen export growth. And so why is this important? If you're following the story about Apple and the iPhone and whether or not they should unlock it, I think there's a piece of this that isn't showing up in the news. And that's that Apple's second largest market for the iPhone is China. And the Chinese consumers are really concerned about having Apple's phone opened up to uh, government scrutiny and how to crack the encryption. And they live in a world where they have a lot more concern about that than maybe we do. So Apple's trying to balance these risks of what do they do in the US market and also still serve their Chinese customers. So it's just kind of interesting to think about how these events here and on the other side of the world and these different cultures all interact with each other. Uh, as we become a more globalized society, what happens on the other side of the world matters to us here in coastal North Carolina. All right, so why is the external sector so uh, important to us? Why are we spending time talking about it? Well, it's especially important in North Carolina because North Carolina is more heavily manufacturing than the rest of the nation. So this is, what is it, it's the third set of bars up there, and I apologize, it's a little on the small side from where you're probably sitting. But North Carolina's employment is still somewhere around 12% of 
uh, in manufacturing. It's higher than that in the coastal areas. In Wilmington, you're talking about 16 or 17 percent manufacturing. Manufacturers are exporting their goods around the world into the rest of the country. So the events that are taking place in our trading partners are affecting employment here, more so than in the rest of the country. All right, so we hear a lot about manufacturing dying and other countries stealing our jobs. Well, let's see, is that really true? So back to Dr. Seuss again. So you'll look up and down the streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. So I thought maybe that applies to this story about manufacturing and companies leaving the US. Other countries are stealing our jobs and that's hurting employment here. So I think that this matches our intuition and our gut much more than it matches the economic reality. So if we look at imports versus unemployment, the blue line is imports as a percentage of gross domestic products. So put in normal terms, that's what percentage of our spending uh, goes towards imported goods. We have this tendency to think that it's everything. You go, well, gee, this pen I have is made in China, and my computer was made in Japan, and I don't buy anything that's made in America anymore. But think about your biggest expenditures every month. My biggest expenditure is rent. My next is food. Where was my house built? Right where it sits now. Where does a lot of our food come from? Neighboring states? Just then just down the road from where you live, we buy an awful lot that's made in the US. We just have a tendency to ignore that. Your dry cleaning, where is it done? Here in North Carolina, right? Probably at the location where you drop your shirts off. We buy a lot that's made here. So I don't think that this story is as true as sometimes we like to think it is. Now, if it was true that as we bought more from the rest of the world that destroyed jobs or eliminated jobs here, you would expect unemployment, the red line, to trend upwards along with imports. They don't match. So what's the story that's going on? Yes, some firms have moved overseas. Yes, they've taken their jobs with them, but we've come up with new jobs here. Imports change the employment of composition. It's similar to technology. It's a change in what we do not how much we do. All right, so I think an even bigger disruptor, what really is the issue, we like to point at imports because saying, oh, other countries are stealing our jobs leads to a nice straw man and a boogeyman and we can point fingers at it. What's really going on? Technology is revolutionizing the workforce and the way we produce. But it's hard to see that, right? So a study performed by a couple of researchers in Oxford said that 47% of employment in the US is at risk of being eliminated the automation. So this is a story about capital and skills going together. And I think as we look forward, this is incredibly important to us. We need to understand technology is going to continue to move forward. How do we set up our workforce and our economy and our way of thinking such that we can thrive in complement to these increases in technology. All right, so this has been accelerating. What the story is is a story of substituting capital for labor and the two complementing each other. All right, so which jobs are most at risk? Uh, so the most at risk jobs are jobs that can be rule based or that follow the same script over and over. So telemarketers, technical support, I mean, it's a long time ago, I hated when you would call into, say, the airlines and get their automated system. Now with some of those, I'd almost rather have the automated system. <laughs> so they're getting better. That puts a lot of those jobs at risk. So, okay, where are those people going to go? That's what we need to be thinking about. Where are the opportunities in the future? It's going to be in the creative capacities to work with that technology. Who? writes the computer code? Who writes the system so that when you call in, it tells you where to go and guides you through it, and that's where the future is. It's hard to automate and computerize those jobs. All right, so having thought about a little bit about these worries of, oh, technology's coming and it's going to shift around where we are, let's think about it again with Dr. Seuss. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsie as you, and then 
And then things start to happen. Don't worry, don't stew, just go right along. You'll start happening too. So that means essentially this is going to happen. We need to think about how do we fit into this new technology-driven world. So manufacturing is declining as a percentage of employment. Yes, absolutely, we've heard that story. But manufacturing output isn't. We produce more in the US than we ever have before. We do it with fewer people. That's fantastic. You know what would be great? Is if we had one person who went to work on January 1, flipped the switch in the factory of the world, and then he and his dog walked out to go enjoy the rest of the year. Right? We don't work to work. We work so that we can purchase the things we want, have the quality of life we want. The more we can produce with less labor allows that labor to go into something else and produce even more. The more we produce, the better our lives will be. So I think this is good. This shows up if we look at output per hour at the US level, uh, productivity has increased. Same thing's true in North Carolina. Manufacturing output per worker is increasing. Technology is allowing us to get more out of our same workers, which frees up workers to go do other things. So where are they going? If we look at North Carolina then and now, in 2001, carried forward to 2014, manufacturing has declined uh, in terms of its percentage of employment, but leisure and hospitality is picking up. Education and health services are picking up. Business services are picking up. So think about that. That means we have fewer people working in manufacturing facilities, we're producing more, and we have more people providing leisure services for all of us? That sounds like a good world. We're headed in the right direction. Is it a smooth transition? No, there's always going to be some bumps along the road. All right, so back to Dr. Seuss as we start to wrap this up. You'll be on your way, you'll be seeing great sights, you'll join the high flyers who soar with great heights. So what does this look like as we go forward? So if we skip to think a little bit about how we're viewing the world, I think there are some pieces to keep in mind. So when I was in Spain, the Spanish have, uh, this past summer I was traveling in Spain, and the Spanish have this saying that means employed in many things. As people work in lots of different positions that sort of cobble together uh, their living and their career. We're seeing some of that in the US as well. So a trend in self-incorporations, in self-employed. So what's driving this? Well, part of it is as we put more requirements on businesses in terms of benefits they have to provide or make it difficult to fire, they hire less. But they still need the work done. So how do they do it? They hire contractors. Europe is farther down this path than we are. So if that's our future as well, how do we prepare our workforce for that? Well, that means we're going to have essentially lots of individual business owners and entrepreneurs, and they need to be equipped with the skills to run their consulting businesses or their contracting businesses. So they need to have a basic set of accounting and management skills. They need to understand personal finance so that they can smooth good times and bad as they go from one contract to the next. Uh, and they need to have the ability to learn new skills. So skill sets that can be transformed and applied. So as I think about this, I think about computer programming. There's some basic ideas. It doesn't matter which language you program in, you have to understand how to build loops, right? So if you, once you understand that idea, you can translate it into a bunch of different areas. We need to make sure that people can think and transform as they go from one opportunity to the next. All right, the second thought looking forward is thinking about technology and how this is going to impact uh, employment. So I think 3D printing will have a huge impact and we're only now starting to see just the very beginning of it. So if we think about what computers used to cost, that's a Tandy computer on the left for $8,500. Uh, it has, what, 20 megahertz of power? and you compare it to the MacBook Pro on a Black Friday sale, which was $800 smaller, has uh, considerably more power. It's just unbelievable how technology has changed our world. When I was growing up, man, if somebody had a car phone, that was unbelievable to us. Now we have the world in our pocket. That trend is probably only going to continue going forward. 
So let's think about it with 3D printing. So 3D printing right now is as much novelty as anything else. It's a fun way to make plastic toys, but that's going to change and grow as we reimagine how to produce. So we're starting to look at ways to even produce uh, or use it in the medical fields, produce implants, et cetera. But here's one that I thought was cool. So if we reimagine how a bicycle is built, the dropouts, the piece that your wheels attach to and bolt onto are typically stamped or formed metal, sort of the old school way of doing it. With 3D printing, that's changing. And as that changes, now companies are reimagining how they build the bicycle. Instead of putting the shifter cables and the brake cables on the outside of the bike, they can build channels in the tubes to guide the cables through it. You're no longer limited by what can we do with the stamping equipment and the metal forming equipment. You're limited by your computer skills and your imagination. That's the complement piece. As these skills come along, as the programming knowledge builds, 3D printing will grow in importance. All right, and one last piece to think about, and that's what do we buy? So think about as we were growing up, what did you want for your birthday? You wanted your mom to bake a cake from scratch. And then it became, all right, we don't need the baked cakes from scratch anymore. We can make them out of the box. And now you can have some more friends over and we'll play a game. Think about birthday parties today. My nephew's birthday party has a bouncy house at it. We've come so far. What is this a story of? It's a story of producing, right, sort of manufacturing production with the cake on the left-hand side to a story of experiences on the right-hand side. We don't just want the tangible good anymore. We want to have this experience that goes with it. So what does that mean for our work first going forward? If people are buying experience, not products, we need to put an emphasis on customer relations and these soft skills as well. So let's wrap up with one final Dr. Seuss quote. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. And will you succeed? Yes. You will indeed, 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. <laughs> Thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, I don't really feel fulfilled unless I've seen some great bar charts and graphs every day. And uh, that was really remarkable. Thank you, sir. And I, I really appreciate the levity you also worked in, into your presentation. I almost want to go and roll again. Um, not quite, but I'm almost there. <laughs> uh, that was a statewide perspective on the economy. Now let's transition to regional employment and industry trends. It's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Kimberly Williams. Kimberly Williams has more than 20 years experience leading human resource professionals in the private sector, public sector, and nonprofit environment to include her current position as Chief Human Resources Officer for the City of Jacksonville. In 2014, after leading a similar initiative in the state of Virginia, Governor McCrory appointed Kimberly to serve as the Executive Director of North Carolina for Military Employment, NC for Me. Ms. Williams has been presented with the Seven Seals Award for Meritorious Leadership and Initiative in support of our Department of Defense twice. At this time, please join me in welcoming Ms. Kimberly Williams. Thank you for having me. Uh, not used to a podium, so if I walk, please give me a heads up. Uh, I will tell you that Secretary Cornell Wilson, Assistant Secretary Ilario Pantana, want to thank you for this opportunity for us to introduce you to Governor Pat McCrory's employment initiative for service members and veterans called NC for Me, North Carolina for Military Employment. So I would like to, and I think I'm right clicking, uh, okay. Okay, it's left clicking. I got this. Um, so I want to also take a moment just to thank Dr. Richard Woodruff with the city of Jacksonville, our mayor, Sammy Phillips, and our council for allowing me the opportunity to do this. Uh, being the director of human resources or the chief human resources officer for the city of Jacksonville is my day job. And this is what I do for my, as a passion for the state of North Carolina and for our service members. So let's talk a little bit about our service members. We trust them with our country. 
we can certainly trust him with our business. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because I'm going to be talking to you about why you should employ service members, and I think you probably get it. But imagine us doing this across the entire state of North Carolina. Why is it important that we do this? The number one driver for economic development, we just had a great presentation on the economy. The number one driver for economic development is talent. So you can imagine when organizations, I'm saying something right because our economist is shaking his head. That's a good sign. So you can imagine when companies, organizations want to come to North Carolina and they want to say, I need 100 electrical engineers. Do you have them? Yeah, we do. Number one driver for economic development. We have over 20,000 service members exiting our bases every year. Every year. Think of that talent. We are the fourth largest, North Carolina is the fourth largest Department of Defense presence in the United States. Four. Think of the talent. So if we're looking at economic development across the state, certainly we want to look at what our workforce looks like, correct? And what a better place. Did you know that the high demand jobs in North Carolina, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that drive those high demand jobs, the biggest concentration of the knowledge, skills, and abilities for those are in our military? I'm thinking maybe we don't know that. I'd like to just take a minute and give you a quick message from the governor. Pat McCrory, you know, North Carolina is putting veterans back to work, and that's good news for them, for the state, and for the country. To give you an example, since 9-11, more than 1,000 veterans have returned to North Carolina's classrooms as teachers. Taking care of our veterans is a sacred trust, and I've directed all of my agencies to make veterans a top priority in hiring. We are cutting red tape, finding efficiencies, and expanding services across the board. And the legislature has joined me in making workforce enrichment a priority with in-state tuition and enhanced credit for military experience. My team is launching a new program to educate employers, human resource professionals, and the community at large about the importance of hiring veterans. Veterans come to the civilian world after being part of an elite workforce, the United States military. Today's veteran is the most technically proficient and best trained in our nation's history. They have the proven knowledge, skills, and workplace ethic employers are looking for. Additionally, veterans stay on the job almost twice as long as their non-veteran peers. Do more than thank a vet for his or her service. Put them to work building North Carolina's economy and future. If you want to make a great hire and help those who sacrifice for our state and our nation, hire a vet. So we've been challenged with making North Carolina the number one state for military employment. <laughs> no, no problem, no challenge, easy, right? Uh, not so easy. I will tell you though, you've got something very, you've got something to be very, very proud of. The model that I'm about to communicate to you is now serving as a model, model for other states. So I'd like to talk to you about why we're doing what we're doing, how we're doing it, and then some of the results. How are we gonna get this done? Well. It's not that easy because, uh, quite honestly, we want to do it without using any taxpayer dollars. So how are we going to do that? That means we've got to create a private and public partnership, which we have. And I always like to, in front of the mic, make sure I thank Cisco and MetLife, who are our founding partners and have funded this initiative, certainly for the first year. Um, but we've also partnered. We've partnered with the USO of North Carolina. Everybody's familiar. Great brand. Great organization. We've partnered with NC Works. That's our jobs initiative. Those are our jobs folks, our workforce solutions under the Department of Commerce. We've partnered with um, the Department of uh, Veterans and Militaries of Military Affairs. We've, we've also partnered with the North Carolina Guard. We've partnered with Employer Support for Guard and Reserve. And we're gonna get that done. So the question is why? Why are we doing this? Why, you know, our military, our service members, our government, our federal government, our state government are doing a really good job getting our service members ready. Why are we doing this? We have great programs. Colonel Salmon will let you know. We have transition readiness programs. We have transition assistance programs. We've got people in here, Megan, who is on my leadership team, Megan with Camp Lejeune, who does an exceptional job getting our service members ready. What do we do? We teach them how to write resumes. 
We teach them how to interview. We teach them how to communicate their skills, their knowledge, skills, and abilities to HR professionals, to business owners, to strategic leaders and companies, right? That's what we do. We do a great job. So why do you need this? Why do we need NC for me? Well, at the end of the day, everything we do is focused on the service member. NC for me does not focus on the service member. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. Why is that important? I started this initiative in Virginia as Virginia Values Vets, and we recognized that focusing on the service member was already being done and being done by great people. And it wasn't impacting that unemployment figure for our, our service members. When we started this, our unemployment number for our service members, our veterans, was higher than the general public at large. I will tell you that we're making an impact. It is now lower for our service members than it is for the general uh, population at large in North Carolina. Think about that, that's huge. Why? We are educating employers. This program is very simple. It's about educating and making employers aware of the value of hiring veterans, the value of hiring service members. Now, why is that important? Let me tell you just a quick story. I am a human resources professional. So if you want a job and you're in human resources, if you want a job, you go to human resources. You're either gonna go to us electronically or you're gonna go to us physically, you're coming in. But you, if you want a job, you're going into a human resources office for the most part, and a small business may be the owner. So if HR is not on board in understanding the value that a service member brings to an organization, it doesn't matter how ready we get our veterans and service members if the employer is not ready to receive them or understand the value. So my background is in human resources. And I hate to admit that I never hired a veteran. I may have, but it certainly wasn't a focus. I directed the human resources function for the United States for Burger King Corporation, over 30,000 employees. Think of the opportunity I had to impact our service members. But why? Why did I not? 1% of this nation's population is in the military. The other 99% is me. Don't have a clear understanding. So what, it, what do I see? This is what I see. I think our service members are wearing a uniform. I think they're shooting a gun. I think they're driving a tank, maybe flying one of these Ospreys that flies over my house every day, right? Shaking my walls. That's what I think. The reality is our service members are attorneys, they're accountants. They do logistics, statistics, food service. Anything that runs a big company, the military has. And also, it just makes good business sense. Think about this. Retention is typically two to one. Service members typically stay on the job twice as long as their peers without military experience. I don't know about you, but if you're in business, I work for the city of Jacksonville, I'd like to know I've got someone that I can hire that'll stay twice as long as someone else and who is high performing. Do you wanna know how I know they're high performing? How many of you get performance evaluations in your organization, right? How many, raise your hand if you get a performance evaluation every year. Every year, someone evaluates your performance, identifies your opportunities to improve, talks about your, your strengths and wants to leverage those. That's great. How about twice a year? How many of you get evaluated twice a year? That's a high performing organization, by the way, city of Jacksonville, twice a year. <laughs> but think about this. In the military, for the most part, your performance is evaluated monthly. Can you imagine if I went to my hiring managers, my, my supervisors, and said, by the way, we're going to evaluate performance every month. We're going to do a performance evaluation, and then we're going to do something really novel, which is identify what your opportunities are to perform better, and then give you the training to do that. Wow. Can you imagine? Back in corporate America, we call that high-performing. HPOs, high-performing organizations, I'm sure you've heard of them. Do you know what the majority of the training is a service member gets? It's not, it's not, the, not, not the majority is about driving tanks and shooting guns. It's about, let me think if any of this makes sense to you, effective communication, teamwork, project management, valuing diversity, ethics and integrity. Are any of those competencies that we wouldn't want to see in our businesses? So our job in putting NC for me together, because then the question is, why are we doing this? Why is this important? Well, here's the why. No one else is fo focusing on the employer. Everyone's focusing on the veteran. Great. Keep it up. Good work. But we need to educate employers across the state. 
I can't tell you how many times I was in human resources meetings and we had people that would come and do presentations, whether it was Marines for Life, you know, ESGR, the USO, hire a vet. It's the right thing to do. I was in corporate America. I will tell you, I never hired anyone because it was the right thing to do. Never. Why? Because you hire people that drive bottom line results. That is it. And I am here to tell you that our service members are a proven success in driving bottom line results for one of the biggest companies in America. Think about that. So this whole program, when we talked about this program and getting our service members employed, it's not about hiring a veteran because it's the right thing to do. That's a given. It's about hiring a proven success and driving bottom line results. And that is the story we are selling across the state. How are we doing that? Well, we put together steering committees, pretty powerful as you can see. We had to have some horsepower, right? We were fortunate enough to connect with these individuals and it, this steering committee doesn't sit up and nod their head, we meet. We meet regularly, we meet every other month, we talk on the phone every week and they're determined to make, make sure that this is a success. We've got Cornell Wilson, we've got General McKissick from our area General Lusk, incredibly important because he runs the National Guard. Not only is he on our steering committee, he has committed all of his resources to this, not just for the Guard, but for active members in our military and for veterans. And what's interesting to me is he's, he's Army, but he says he'll do it for the Marines and everyone else too. So <laughs> good guy. Um, we've got General Gorham, Will Collins, who's with uh, our Department of Commerce, Elaria Pantana, and then our two founding partners, Banu Thomas, who is with MetLife, and Michael Vesey with Cisco. These individuals are focused on making North Carolina the number one state for military employment. And I will tell you, we've had good success. The question is, that's why we're doing it. I said I would tell you how we're doing it. And it's very simple. It doesn't take a, a, you know, a rocket scientist to figure this one out, I will tell you. It was just about pulling the right team together. We have to convince strategic leaders across the state on the value of hiring service members, not because it's the right thing, but the value, right? Strategic leaders are those people that set the strategic vision in an organization. So if a strategic leader says, as our strategic leader in the city of Jacksonville, Richard Woodruff, Dr. Woodruff says, we want to make it a priority to hire service members and veterans. We want to take a percentage of our vacant positions and commit to hiring service members and veterans. If we could get every organization to do that at the strategic level, those individuals that set the strategic vision for the company. But then I would argue that if you get that strategic leader on board and don't get HR on board, it's not going to work. Because HR is the gatekeeper. So you got to get, gate, you got to get HR on board. You've got to get people like me, like Megan, on board. If you get us on board, but not the strategic leaders, I argue yet again, it will not work. So we had to figure out how do we get the strategic leaders on board? We hold education summits across the state. We have anywhere from 100 to 250 people at those summits. We've done it in Raleigh. We've done it in Charlottesville, Greensboro, May 18th. We're going to be in Raleigh again, and it's being hosted at the Joint Force Headquarters. And we... We share data on how we can show service members are a proven success in driving bottom line results. And we impact the way that those strategic leaders think. And we get them on board. And then we get a commitment from them before they leave the room. We trap them. <laughs> then we get HR on board. How do we do that? Is anyone familiar? I know we've got HR professionals in the room. Anyone familiar with the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM? We've got members of SHRM here. In order to be an HR professional in this country, you truly need to be certified as either a senior professional or a professional in HR. You need those certification credits. You get those through Society of Human Resource Management. So it's a captive audience. There's 18 chapters of SHRM across the state. We have a military liaison coordinated every one of those 18 chapters. We had it voted on at the state level. We got them placed at the local level, and those are the in individuals that are also helping us send the message and educating HR professionals. So this thing is spidering. We've got the strategic leaders. We've got the HR professionals. We're changing mindsets, right? Then what? Small businesses. I was made aware. I was not aware. I was made aware that the majority of our service members, about 75%, will work in small and medium-sized businesses. So we had to get our small business centers on board through our community college system and educate those people that own small businesses. 
And then finally, the last piece of the puzzle is the talent supply. The first three circles, that's all demand side, but it doesn't do us any good unless we can give them those 20,000 a year transitioning service members, right? Those people we want to keep in North Carolina, right? Because we want to drive our economy. So we get an opportunity to work with people like Megan, with uh, Megan Jones with uh, Camp Lejeune and all of our transitioning offices to talk about what we're doing here in the great state of North Carolina to keep our service members here and what companies are interested in employing them. It's interesting because when I started this initiative, I became aware that the majority of us really don't understand the value. I'm probably preaching to the choir because you probably do get it. You're, you're fortunate to live here in, in Jacksonville or, or Onslow County, which is the home of the Marines and the sailors. So we understand the military. I've recently moved here. I will tell you, I lived in the mountains of Virginia, never saw a uniform. So although we understand the value of hiring veterans and service members, and I'm assuming we do, I will tell you the majority of the state does not. And that's what our job is, is to educate them. Let's talk a little bit about our success. And I'm only gonna mention the hiring events. We could put up some charts and talk about what we've done so far to move minds. And that's hard to measure. <laughs> but let's talk about hiring events. These are not job fairs that we do across the state. These are hiring events. So our goal is to do an education session that I just talked about with strategic leaders. And 10 weeks later, we do a hiring event. Those hiring events are predetermined interviews. So we'll get companies lined up with jobs, we get our talent that's getting ready to exit the military, and we match. And there's a lot of time and energy put into that. We set up interviews. I want you to think about this. I know many of you have been to hiring events. Many of you as employers have been there. You hand out trinkets, you might get a hire. Chances are if you're there going to a, hiring, a, a job fair, you don't get a job. I think it's like one or 2% success rate for job fairs across the country, we have almost 70% success rate in hiring events. Why is that? Because we're doing the work up front. We know who's coming, we know what jobs are available, we know the skills and we make the match. We decided to pilot a program with Department of Public Safety. One of the toughest jobs to fill across the state is corrections officers. It took about six months to get someone in and get them started. I won't go through the detail of how we did this, but now we do it under 30 days, we hired 370 corrections officers. Those are transitioning service members. We had over 900 interview, interviews and close to 600 job offers. I don't know about you, but as a business person, certainly me as an HR professional, if you tell me that my recruitment costs are really nothing because we don't charge for this, that you're gonna give me someone that's gonna stay on the job twice as long as someone without military experience, right? And I only have to interview two people to know I want to hire one? I mean, that's just good business sense. Finally, at our, job, at our summits, at our education summits, what we do is we get a pledge. It doesn't do any good to talk about hiring service members and veterans and not getting a commitment. So we have those strategic leaders and those HR professionals sign a pledge form. But we don't stop there. Then... Pam House, who directs the workforce centers across the state, General Lusk's team at the Guard, Ms. Melissa Warner, who's with talent acquisition with the governor's team in the Office of Human Resources at the state level, and the USO, and employer support for Guard and Reserve. I want you to think about coordinating all of those, event those organizations. Follow up with every single one that's, every single person that signs a pledge form goes into their business and talks about those individuals that we can put into their location that could meet their needs, what knowledge, skills, and abilities they have that we can put into vacant positions that they have in their organization. I think what's important to realize is this is simply a public-private collaborative partnership with existing resources. And it's only been in existence for just under a year. Think about a startup, no, no capital and the results that we've already achieved. So we're excited to be able to do this across the state. Again, I want to thank the city of Jacksonville for allowing me the opportunity to do it, and I want to thank all of you for your support as we do this for the state of North Carolina. Thank you.